Jeff Coates, the CEO and creative director of Line 58 Branding and Web Design. Line 58 is a nationally sought after brand strategy studio working with visionary small businesses on inspiring projects. Whether it's a startup or an established venture, Jeff brings an entrepreneurial sensibility to every project. Line 58's branding and packaging work includes iconic local brands such as Aiden Gill for Men, Atomic Burger, as well as international retail brands like Promaster. Oh, he has some examples I'll show you in a minute. Um, beyond his work at Line 58, Jeff is very near and dear to our hearts because he helped launch our parent organization, the Urban Conservancy, um, and also helped file Stay Local in 2003. So we're very excited to have him speak here today um, about branding and packaging, and he will give you a full rundown. So please welcome Jeff Coates. Thanks so much. Um, I got to hear a little bit of the, the conversation this morning, so I think it'll be a nice, a nice dovetail here. Um, that seems to be some really good sort of tactical advice, and um, what I'm going to do is try and pop up a little bit and talk a little bit more at a strategic branding level. So, for those of you who don't know, um, you know I'm, I'm Jeff Coates, work with Line 58, and we're a strategic branding studio here in New Orleans. And we work in a lot of different ways, but basically the bottom line is that we work with our clients to grow their top level revenues and grow their businesses. And the way we do that is by working on complex problems around brand strategy and differentiation in the marketplace. So everything from print work to environmental graphics to web and mobile to packaging You can kind of see this and you know every, everything that we do and so what people see a lot of times is the thing that we do right they see the logo they see the website they see the package um, but what I want to talk about is what we actually do which is the thought that comes behind that object and that's the strategy piece so specifically what I want to do I'm going to do sort of a three-part talk in which only two parts of it are me talking. The third is going to be for questions, because I think it'll be much more interesting if I'm answering your actual questions rather than questions I think you might want to know something about. So that's the teacher in me. I want everybody to learn something today. That was my former training as a professor. But um, what I want to do in this first part of this is we get a lot of clients who come to us, and we see patterns of mistakes that get made. And these aren't, you know, it's not because people are bad people, it's just that, you know, you haven't thought through these things, sometimes it's people's first business. Um, and so what I'd like to do at the, at the very outset here is just give you a couple things to think about, questions that you might want to push yourself a little harder on to make sure you know the answer before you invest in branding. After that, I want to give you an introduction to sort of Vine 58's philosophy on branding. It's, there's a lot of different philosophies, so this is just kind of ours, how we approach it. And then, as I said, the third part, I just want to open it up, and then if you guys have specific questions uh, that I can answer, I would be happy to try and answer those. And if they involve something really hard, MJ from our studio is here in the back, and he's a lot smarter than I am, so he's, he's going to answer those questions. So, the first question, and this seems pretty basic, but we've seen it missed a lot, is, is there a market for what you are making or producing? Um, you know, you like it, you're into it, your friends like it. Okay, great. Um, really what we want to talk about, what we start to try to understand is, does your product solve a problem? And does it solve it at a price point that your customers are willing to pay? Right, and that's a fundamental test before investing in branding. Uh, we have this conversation a lot in our studio which is that I am a firm believer that solid branding, good messaging, marketing well executed can take a brand and give it a glide plane and really launch it. Mm -hmm. But no amount of branding can compensate for a flawed business model. So if the business model is fundamentally not sound, then there's potentially a problem. And I've blurred this out a little bit, <clears throat> um, but you know, this is an example of we work with a client um, local architects and architects always love this thing, right? They work in the service industry. I work in services, so I understand this. It's like, I want to make a product and sell it so that I don't have to constantly be selling and selling and selling. These guys were makers. They had CNC machines. They had all kinds of cool toys. 
And they were like, what if we just made some furniture and then sold that furniture to West Elm, to Crate and Barrel, and then we could make money and not be selling all the time. Great philosophy. Uh, they reached out, they talked to Crate and Barrel, they talked to West Elm, they talked to some other people. They figured out, oh, you need print materials and you need a website before we're even gonna talk to you. That's kind of like just jump. So we created these materials, they hired photographers, they did the prototypes, all of this work. And about two months after we launched this, they were like, this doesn't work at all. Shut down the company. They were like, and now, I'm happy to say they're super successful doing the stuff that they were originally doing. But none of that investment made any sense for them. That was all money, and that wasn't because we didn't do our job right, and it wasn't because the photographer didn't do their job right, and it wasn't because the website wasn't responsive. Right? All those pieces were in place. It was just the business model was flawed. And so the thing about this is, had they spoken to some older architects in town who have also had the same dream and who also had shops and built furniture, they would have discovered potentially earlier on what the problems with that model were. Um, and they may have made a different decision. So always make sure that you're asking yourself about, do you really have a product? Does the market want the product? And are you able to deliver the product at the price point that makes sense? This is perhaps the most important question and the one that people think about the least. And that is, what are you branding? Are you branding a product, or are you branding a company? Or, as I like to put it, do you ever plan to have another idea? Because you cannot believe the number of times that we have clients who come in to our studio with this problem. We had a product, and we built a company around the product, and we built a brand around this product. Now we have a second product, which is not related to the first product, so stick that into our company and tell the story. And it's like, well, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you're selling this thing over here, and you're selling that thing over there, and there's no story which brings those two things together, right? So. Um, if you think about it and try to project forward, even if it's just a bit of a dream, you know, think about it because it really makes a difference. <clears throat> so when we were working with Flavor Paper back in 2003, I think we started uh, with the original branding and the original marketing materials, we knew that this was going to be a lifestyle brand. This was not a single pattern of wallpaper that was going to be made. And so the brand for Flavor Paper was built to accept the expansion, right? And so, for instance, when you look, here's a showroom up in Brooklyn now, and these are all the different types of uh, wall covers, right? Because now it's not even all wallpaper. There's wallpaper, there's digital graphics, and those pillows are products as well, right? And so by knowing what you're building, are you putting your money into building your company, or are you putting your money into just marketing a single product? Because you'll make different decisions. Here's an example of some product packaging that we did for a local chef. And this was a very straightforward problem. Um, that The chef, their product was good. It had been accepted into Whole Foods. Whole Foods looked at their packaging was like, that's not going on our shelf. We have standards. Um, and so basically they came to us to redesign that. So if you'll notice, there's a little tiny NOLA Foods at the top. But we didn't really design a brand. This was about designing labels to get the product on the shelf in a very short period of time. Different design project, different price points, different outcomes, and so thinking a little bit about that will help you make the right choices for your brand. We can move it up in complexity. Um, this is a brand that we did, um, it's a legacy brand, brand, been around since the late 1950s, early 1960s, and looked like it. Um, it, had a, it had a problem in that it had products at many different price point and quality points, but they were all under the same brand, there was no differentiation. So some of their products were a great buy, and some of their products were, you know, cheap, because people need cheap stuff sometimes, right? So thousands of SKUs, literally thousands and thousands of SKUs, and so we had to build a brand system that could hold that. And so if you look at this, what you start to see is some of the packaging is red. That's a professional level product. Some of the packaging is yellow. That's a more active hobbyist level product. product. But it took a lot more thought. It's more of a brand system. And so thinking about that, 
helps you make those decisions about how to actually create the brand. What differentiates your product? Um, you know, is it just a new thing that everybody's seen before, but yours is better? Is it a new thing that everybody's seen and yours is less expensive? Is it something everybody knows and it's really expensive, but it's really worth it? Um, what differentiates you? So, you know, we spend a lot of time, I said that, you know, at our core, what we do at Line 58 is that we solve these complex problems around differentiation of brand strategy. Because if your brand is not differentiated, you're a commodity, right? And so then you're just in the commodity market. So how do we differentiate you? So when we were creating the brand for AP Guild for Men, um, there were two things about this. Number one, if any of you have met Aiden, Aiden is the brand, right? <laughs> like him or not, he's Aiden and he ain't changing. So that's what you're selling, right? The second piece is, and you have to go back a number of years to, to, to realize this, but when we were working on this, there weren't really these high-end men's barber shops. There was your old school on the corner barber shop, and then there was unisex everything, right? And so basically creating this differentiation here was creating a space that was very masculine and fashionable, right? And so, you know, in creating these things that are a little washed out because of the projector, but you can kind of see that, you know, basically we tried to bring some of that personality into this brand. You get these like quotes on the backs of the business cards and whatnot, right? You know, one style is an idiom arising simultaneously or spontaneously from personality, but deliberately maintained. You know, that's like sort of a, he, he loves this kind of stuff. But also we didn't want it to be too highfalutin, so we used copy in words to sort of back it down a little bit too. So you get things like, the gift certificate, which says even the man who has everything needs a haircut, right? Mm -hmm. So again, sort of walking those lines and bringing that differentiation into the market so that he could put that around him and begin to sell those products. This is a great one. What information do customers need to understand your product? If you're a maker, if you're, or if you're you know, someone who's always in your store or at your restaurant or whatever, right? It's very, you can fill in all these gaps, right? And so you know the story and you can kind of jump in. But it's really great up front to put some time into thinking about what information, if I wasn't there, if this is going to sell in a retail location where I'm not, what, how, do we, how do I differentiate that? How do people understand what that is that makes it different? So that as you're designing things, as you're building your brand, you at least know, I need to build something that communicates X, right? So <laughs> creating a brand for Atomic Burger, one of the things that we were looking at was how to communicate the value proposition, which is how they're differentiated, right? So here you've got on the wall, you can break your old habit, our beef is fresh, freezing is for shakes. Um, Here's a screenshot of a website, fast food done right, house ground daily, our beef is fresh, freezing for shakes, right? So, so what we're doing is they are reinventing fast food and trying to bring in higher quality ingredients. But that means there's a higher price point. There's no getting around that, right? If you're not using lips and toes, you know, it's going to cost you a little bit more to make a burger. And so, you know, we had to communicate that and create those things because the owner can't guarantee that every time they're going to be at the register to tell that story, to communicate why it's going to cost more, um, what the value proposition is. And then uh, this may overlap with some of the stuff you were talking about uh, this morning, but it's do you know the packaging, content, and display requirements? So for instance, on that food packaging that's going into Whole Foods, there's very specific things that have to be on that label. Um, if when we were doing the ProMaster packaging, there's very specific things that have to go on some of that packaging uh, because it's sold internationally. And so some stuff is required, but some stuff is also just an opportunity if you can think about it. So do you know how your product is going to be displayed? Is it going to be hung on some pegboard? One thing that people often overlook is that packaging is generally a three-dimensional object. 
right? Which means it has sides, which means somebody may see different information if they look at the side. Um, if you look, so again, by asking some of these questions, here's some of these ProMaster packaging that you're looking at here, right? So if you look, there's, there's, we created this thing that's sort of like a tab that wraps around the corner, which allows certain information to be able to be displayed on different sides of boxes. If you look at the flash, you'll notice that some of the copy reads if it's sitting on the shelf this way, and some of it reads if you sit on the shelf the other way. And this came through discussions. With, they have hundreds of retailers across uh, the United States and Canada. And when we met with those retailers and we did interviews, this is not like a Banana Republic where they just say, this is what the display looks like, and it's going to look like that in every store that you walk into. Right? They don't have that. There's, it's a bunch of independent retailers. And you guys may encounter that in some of the environments that you're going into. And so basically what they said is, some guys are going to put this on the, on the shelf. Some guys are going to take all those tripod boxes and make a pyramid out of them in the middle of the, you know, the floor. We don't know. And that packaging has to work no matter how that sets up. So sometimes you are, if, you, if you think about what the opportunities are, if you think about what the requirements are, they can lead you to interesting solutions that then help drive customer engagement, which then drives money, right? You may also discover opportunities for ancillary things. So for instance, in retail sales of camera and, and especially of filters, none of the retailers want to put the filters down on a piece of glass on the countertops. So they have these neoprene or soft pieces that sit out, and then they put the, the filters on those so they don't get, uh, get scratched. That became an opportunity. So we created these branded mats that we gave away free to the retailers. Because we talk, we're like, hey, if you get one for free, will you put it out? Yeah, of course they will, right? So now, no matter, even if they're looking at lenses or uh, filters made by the competition, <laughs> all the brand around it is yours, right? Everything, are, well, hey, what about this? What about the, is this a better thing? Well, you might want to look at that, right? So that may lead them to ask a question. Uh, in the background, you can kind of see blurred in the back there uh, uh, an idea for a poster um, that could, again, if they, the person in the retail space is willing to give you some wall space behind your display. Hey, I can ship you this poster. And then you get into things. Earlier it was mentioned shelf talkers, right? And so if you look down sort of in the bottom here, you'll see a series of shelf talkers that go along with this material as well that are about, hey, here's the tripods. Which one is right for you? You know, do you want the pro level? What's the difference in the pro level versus uh, the not pro level? What do, you, what do you want? Which filter is right for you? That kind of stuff. So if you ask some questions of your vendors, of your retail outlets, and you find some of these opportunities, you may find places for your messaging. And then if you've thought about, going back a moment, if you've thought about what needs to be communicated and what differentiates you, then you know what to put on that card. And so that's how that kind of ties together. So now what I want to do is take just a, a few minutes and give you an introduction sort of to the branding philosophy, the way I see it and then open it up to questions for you know, any, anything you want. If I have an answer, I'll give it to you. So the biggest uh, differentiator for me, and the biggest thing that I think most uh, startup businesses, and even some pretty well-established ones, get wrong, um, is ideas versus things. You can also think of that as strategy versus tools, right? Pretty much. It takes a very sophisticated client to walk into our studio and say, I need some brand strategy. It almost never happens, right? Um, people come in and they say, I need a website. I need a brochure. I need packaging, you know? That, those are things, right? I need a website, that's a thing, right? But what's, why do you need the website? What's the strategy behind it, right? And I think that as business owners, too often we're like, oh, I need that thing that everybody else has. I need that social media thing. I need that, that website. I need that brochure. And one of the first conversations when, when clients come in and they're like, I need a website, I'm like, why? Well, because our website's old and it's ugly. I'm like, yes, it is and it is. But why do you need one, right? Well, I want to grow a business. What, what do you want to grow your business? Well, we're at a million and we want to get to 1.5. Or we're at 6 million and we want to get to 8. Okay, if I can get you that $2 million in revenue without a website, you still want to do the website? No. 
well, then you don't really want the website, right? What you want is the $2 million. So if you think about the strategy and only invest in the tools when you understand what the tool is supposed to get you and how that tool is going to make the return on investment, the ROI that you need, you'll think about all this stuff in a much, much different way. And you will not be throwing away, uh, you know, I don't care if it's $2,500 to, you know, the kid in the coffee shop who's going to make your website or whether it's $45,000, you know, for an e-commerce site, you know. Whatever it is, you're wasting it, so. You guys may have encountered these questions. They've been kind of hip and cool uh, lately, but, you know, I think they're worth repeating. Um, who are you? What do you do? And why does it matter? You need to be able to answer those questions to build an effective brand. And almost everybody can answer the first one because they know the name of their company. Most people can answer the second one. Very few people can answer the third. And it's the why it matters. That's the, that's the really important one, right? Even if it is trendy, it's still important. Now, why is part of this so tricky, right? You know, I always get, people are like, branding, what is it? I don't know. Um, I haven't figured it out yet. But one of the problems is it's, it, it can be so many different things. And that's why it's important for you as a business owner to make your own thoughts about which of the pieces you need. Because you can spend a lot of money on any one of these pieces. Right? So, you know, some people think of the logo when they think of the brand. Some people think of color palette. Some people think of personality. Some people think of typography. Some people think of the clarity of the messaging. Some people think of the brand promise. Some people think of support policies or the ease of use. Those are all parts of your brand. But very few companies, and especially startups, can afford to address all of those at the beginning or all of them simultaneously. So it's very important to think about when you're talking with someone about branding, if you're going to a design studio to ask them about building your brand, they're probably not going to talk to you about your support policy, although that may be the most important part of your brand. So to know that going into it is, is really important. And, you know, I use this as an example a lot. No one has ever brought the Zappos website to our studio as an example of a cool website. <laughs> right? Nobody, they always bring us like, I want it to look like Apple. And they're great, so does everybody. You know? um, but this is really effective branding. This is really, really strategic and really, really effective. Why? What was the brand problem that Zappos had when they were starting out? They're trying to convince people to buy shoes over the internet. How am I going to buy shoes I've never tried on? That's crazy. No one is going to do that, right? Free shipping. Free returns. Free returns. Free shipping. Right? Words. Words can be your brand. Tell people what's compelling. Tell people what they need to know. Another great one. I love these guys. Rackspace. They sell web hosting. It is the most boring commodity thing ever. It's a race to the bottom. How cheap can I get it? I don't ever want to think about it until it doesn't work. And then you call, and then you get support that sucks. And then you're really upset. Because now you don't have a website, and you don't have anyone who's supporting you. So these guys built an entire company around this idea of fanatical support. They saw a differentiation in the market, the place that they could own in the marketplace by coming in. And they grew, and they grew. And they're, you know, they're a great company. But they knew their brand, right? They knew what differentiated them. So this goes back to that thing of know where are you making a difference. That's the most important thing. Where are you making a difference? Where are you doing something better than someone else is doing it? Doing it differently than someone else is doing it? Doing it less expensively than someone else? You know, those can, those can all be, there's many, many different things you can differentiate on. Price, service, features, you know. And always, always, always ask yourself, not sort of what do I want, which leads you to website, brochure, you know, packaging. But always start with the question, you know, what do you want to achieve? What's the goal that you're trying? Are you trying to put more people in your restaurant on off nights? That's what you want to achieve. Now, you can be agnostic about how you achieve that. Because now any tool is, is the right tool if it delivers those seats. You know, butts and seats, right? And the key, and this is what's so frustrating, I think, about, about 
you know, the industry that I'm in, we have people come to us all the time who are like, well, I spent all my money and I didn't get anything. Okay. Right? And that sucks. It sucks for them and it sucks for us. Um, because, you know, it's, it's an industry where there's, you know, there's no, uh, there's a low barrier to entry, shall we say. You know, basically what I say is like, anybody with a laptop in a coffee shop is a brand studio. Any two of them who happen to meet each other are a digital agency. <laughs> and, for, and for you guys who, you know, they can put up an awesome website, right? And you guys, it's hard to tell the difference. It's hard to know who's selling what. And you can put a lot of money into something and not get something back. And so if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, this is my point, if you haven't decided what those metrics are, then any amount of money you spend is going to be wasted. Every penny you spend on social media that projects the wrong message is wasted money. Every bit of money you spend on your website that doesn't communicate the value of your product is wasted money. Right? And so that's where I think people are like, well, I don't know, I put up a website, didn't really see any business from it. It's like, well, there might be a bigger problem. You know, maybe it's like, because the website, if you think about it, the website is a piece of technology. Right? And I tell people, like, in our business, right, you can get a logo for $5, and you can get web hosting and a site design, like with Squarespace or whatever, for $4 a month. So for $9, you're in. So why is anyone going to come and pay me what they pay us, right? It's because of the delivery of that strategy and that revenue. It doesn't happen sometimes that it's just put together. It's the same thing. I tell people, like, I can go to Lowe's and I can buy a table saw. You do not want me to build your furniture. <laughs> That's just the truth, right? So closing up here. Um, you know, a brand to us, when we talk about brands, when I think about brands, brands are not just logos. Um, they're not your business papers, they're not your sign, they're not your packaging, they're not your tagline. Basically, it's an emotional connection. And I know it sounds trite, I know it does, but I'm serious. It really, this is it. The brand is the emotional connection, and it's a relationship. It's a real relationship. Which means, like all relationships, um, think about it just in the same terms as all your relationships. It's about honesty and about authenticity. This is a place I think a lot of people get branding wrong. It is about consistency, but it's about what I call human consistency. Like a lot of people are like, you know, your brand is Pantone 149 and using this typeface, right? And, and we're always going to use this logo. This is our one logo and we're always going to use it. And that's, that's, Great, okay, that's the entry level, you know. Try to get your color right, try to use your logo, okay. But that really isn't it. I always say that like really good brands can dress up, they can dress down, they feel right in different environments. And the reason I call it human consistency is, is I like to say that if you go to uh, a friend's house for a barbecue and it's out by the pool and everyone's wearing swimsuits and shirts and they have a drink and everyone's hanging out in flip-flops, right? And then four days later, you run into somebody from that party around a boardroom table and they're wearing a three-piece suit. You don't not recognize the person. It's, it's still your friend. You still get that. That they dress up, they dress down. And so that's that sort of human level consistency of making sure you know, it isn't just about sort of rules and regulations, it's about being the same. Whether someone encounters your product on the shelf, they walk into your office, they walk into your restaurant, they see the website, whatever it is, those should all feel related. And so finally, to me, it's about promises and fulfillment. If you can't fulfill it, don't promise it, right? And everything you promise, make sure you fulfill, because that's the trust, that's, that's what differentiates you from the charlatans. So be honest, be yourself, and be sure you know where you want to go, because otherwise people are just going to take you where they want to go. You know, I think it was in the last session you said, you know, the, the buyer for the other store you're trying to put your product in, yeah, they're working for their store, they're not working for you, right? And so if you don't know where you're trying to go, there's a lot of people who will take you on whatever journey they happen to be on and that's not what you want. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions and see if there's anything specific I can help anybody with.
Thanks so much for listening. decision that honestly could change in a couple years um, and that is because years ago um, people would come to us for identity in business papers and brochures and people don't really that much anymore I mean, we, we still do print work but it's minimal right the kids they want the web <laughs> so you know that's a positioning thing for us um, and the brand is actually, the brand could, could di diverse, uh, divorce itself from that website, but it's a strategic decision. Because people identify with that tool. Mm -hmm. and, and then once they come in to talk about that tool, we can have a much larger conversation. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's where most, that's where, <laughs> you know, to get mercenary about it, that's where people have budgets allocated. Yeah. And yeah. that's what they think they need, even if they don't, and they need something else. But once we can start the conversation, you wouldn't believe how many complete, we, we just launched a rebrand this week for uh, Advantage Medical Professionals, or medical staffing firm, have been Advantage Nursing for years and years and years. That conversation started with, here's an RFP for a website that we need help with. And I just responded, you don't need a website. Let's talk. And then, from that, we were able to have the conversation about what we were going to do. Good question, though. Yeah? Can you speak to how important the color is in your branding, the color that you choose? Yeah. Um, so color is important. Um, but it's something I, uh, interestingly, in, in our approach, right, I don't want to be talking to a client about color because I don't care what their favorite color is. And that's why we want to go into the strategy piece, because the way we get to color is not from what's your favorite color, right? Um, do you like this typeface, right? Those are the discussions that a lot of, like, I never want to have those discussions, right? Because now we're talking about art, and now we're talking about personal preferences, and oh, it matches the couch, so let's, you know, I went to LSU, let's make it purple, no. Um, so what we want to do is we want to get from the strategy conversation, who's your target audience? What are their demographics? How old are they? How much money do they make? Male, female, where do they live? What other brands do they live in? You know, do they drive a Toyota or do they want a Beamer? You know, where, where are they? Uh, you know, what world do they swim in? And then color for that particular brand comes out of the audience that you need to con connect with, not out of Jeff hasn't done a brand with blue lately, so I want to do blue. Or, the owner of the company really loves mauve, you know. Said nobody since 1983. <laughs> <laughs> Does that help? Yes. Yeah. I was asking um, about affordability. Do you work with any startups? Yes, we do. Do you have a space for them? <laughs> we do. Um, we are not a low cost provider, though, so it's one of those things that has to be fit. Um, our general rule, and then you'll know if, if you sort of fit or not, you know, so here, here's our, our, our sort of general rule that then we break for the right clients, which is never if it's your first startup, and never if it's your own money, right? And I'll tell you why, because sometimes we actually do work with people who it's their first startup and it's their own money, but the, the reality behind that is people who've never done it, A, want everything. Because they've seen Facebook, so they want that for fifteen hundred bucks. You know, can you build me Facebook for fifteen hundred bucks? No, you can't. Um, and at the beginning of the project, there's no sense of perspective. And then, as the project ramps up, especially if there's building and like restaurant buildouts, oh Jesus, you know. So you know, the cost, everything goes up. Oh wait, the hood cost ten thousand more than we thought it was going to, and oh, they found termites, and oh, this and that, and everything goes up and doesn't, and their checkbook is going down and down and down, and they cross this point where they freak out, right? 
and then it's not good for anybody, right? Because you're halfway through a project, and then it's like, well, can we trim this down? Can we not do that? Can we do this other thing? You know, so, so we do work with startups uh, when it's a good fit. Um, and if what we try to do is meet each company where they are. And so the first conversation we have is about money. Because, and people get freaked out by that. They're like, you know, well, wait a minute. I don't want to tell you how much money I have. And it's like, that's like going to the doctor and being like, Fix me. What hurts? I'm not telling you. Right? You know, it's like, uh, is it in your stomach? I don't know. You're the doctor. You tell me. How much does it, you know, what, what's wrong? How much does the website cost? I don't know. Right? We do, you know, we do $12,000 websites and we do $180,000 websites. Right? And so, what's the difference? The amount of time it takes. Right? And what it needs to do. Now, those high-end ones generate a lot more than $180,000, so nobody cares what it costs. Right? Because they're watching the top line. So, um, as long as people are willing to talk openly about budgets and scopes and what we can achieve, uh, we love that. We love that. Yeah. So your information is excellent, and you and I know you know what you're talking about. So, and since the first thing you talk about is money, a lot of small businesses don't have it. So it's like you're not open to, because you're excellent, who would not want to work with you? So, but when the money's not there, so where do you go? Because I can't come to you. So where do you go to get a, a small business to get the excellent information mm -hmm. that you're providing and that your company can give when there's no way that you can basically go there because of finances? So. Is yes, there, what do you do? Okay, first off, if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you there's definitely people who don't want to work with me. But um, the, the question is good. So what we try to look for, right, is what we want to understand is what can we achieve, right? So let's say you're selling shoes, right? And your shoes are, you know, they're designer shoes. Um, they're going to be priced at $500 per pair. And just, I was a history professor, so I like math. I get lost on it, so please excuse me if I get this wrong. But anyway, so you're selling like you know your shoes, and you're you're selling four pairs a month, right? 